wife. Uh, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, you guys are half awake. You know, the, the 830 is just a little bit better. You know, they just have that good morning. It's just a little bit more, more crisp. But you guys are my favorite. I tell them the same thing as well. You know, you can't pick a favorite child if you have more than one child. I do have a favorite child, but what I tell all of my children is like, I'll tell Benjamin, hey, you're my favorite Benjamin. And he's like, I know, Dad. He loves it. Like, you know, he just feels like it, you know. Wyatt's my favorite, by the way. He's our youngest. Uh, I've had to pick one of the three. But, all right, so I want to welcome you guys here. Um, if this is your first time, thank you for coming. Uh, so happy to have you here with us at the beginning of the year. Uh, we are doing what almost everyone is doing, and we are talking about uh, New Year's resolutions. We're talking about becoming better people. We're talking about doing better. Uh, last week, I talked about truth over resolution, because truth is absolutely true. Because it's absolute, it doesn't require you. You don't have to do anything for a truth to be a truth. It just is. Whereas a resolution... You have to do what you say, you have to do what you set out to do in order for it to come true. And so I think I like truth over resolutions. And today I kind of want to uh, expand on that uh, this week and then for the rest of January. We're talking about becoming better and doing better. And we never set goals for ourselves to pick up extra bad habits or to pick up extra bad things. Like we don't Make it our, it's, I mean, it's not my goal to gain, you know, 35 kilograms this year. Uh, you know, it's, it's my goal to lose weight. It's not your goal to add an addiction. Nobody says, you know, hey, I want to pick up nicotine this year. You know, I feel like my life could use one more of those. You know, everything that we kind of decide that we want to do, all of our resolutions, our convictions or whatever, those are all things that, that we feel like make us better. So it's betterment. It's becoming better. And so today's message is about how to become better. And one of the most powerful ways that we can become better, and it all starts with our thinking. It starts with our mind. And today's message is called Mind Shift. Renew your mind through transforming your life. So there's a, a life application to this, and then there's a, a mind and a thinking application to this. And, I, and I, I always start out when I prepare these messages asking myself the question, why does this matter to you? Why, you know, I could stand up here and I could say, hey, uh, this is what the Bible says. And so because it's in Romans, which we're going to look at today, you just should take it at face value and believe it and apply it to your life. And because it's there, it's amazing. And I can't believe that your life wasn't changed on Sunday morning. What's wrong with you? You know, if that were true, then that would make me the holiest person in the room because I never miss a Sunday. And we know my wife's not in here anymore, but she would be the first to tell you that that is not true. I am not the holiest person in the room because it's not just about uh, exposing yourself to what, what I'm teaching or what I'm saying or even studying it. it. It's got something to do with your mind, the way that you think about it, with what you do with your thought life. And, and that's what we're going to talk about, how important that is. So I feel pretty confident in saying that at some point in today's message, you're going to say, yes, I want this for my life. Yes, you, you've convinced me. And I'm not here to convince you of Jesus. I hope you get Jesus. But even if you're not about the Jesus thing, I do believe that you'll say, you know what? I can apply this to me. This can help me to have a better year. This can help me start out in a better way this year. This can deal with something that I've been unable to deal with up to this point. And so I, I'm, I'm confident in that. So now that I'm confident in it, now that I've told you what to look for um, in, in, in kind of earning the ability for you to apply this to your life, I want to earn your trust. I want you to, to trust what we say. Now let, let's, let's go into it. So I want to start out with something kind of a, a little bit humorous. Because our thoughts are so important, um, have you ever been in a situation where you've looked at something and you've thought to yourself, what are they thinking? You know, what, is, what, what, what went through their mind? What on earth are they thinking? You know, I'll, I'll give you an example here. Let me illustrate this with a picture here. This is a, a playground, and it has one of the spiral poles in it, right? And uh, this is a grown man that's in this uh, pole right here that's stuck. Now, what, you can look at this, you can say, what, were the, what was he thinking? 
Because there was a thought process. You don't accidentally fall into this. You, he climbed up there. He got in position. He thought, hey, this is a good idea. Let me try this. Would it be funny if I went down there? And then, you know, and then God said, so this is a, a what were they thinking kind of moment. Here's another moment of, of what were they thinking. So it's a rainy day. And here's a guy. He's got an umbrella, but he's not using it. It's not open. He's covering it with his head. Now, this is a situation where I feel like that as I watch a lot of you kind of go throughout the day and go throughout life, and you watch the people that are around you, there's a lot of these moments where you see people do things the way that they do them, and they think, what on earth are they thinking? For those that have been around long enough, if you're here before the service on Sunday mornings, you'll see me walking around with, um, uh, you know, the jugs that you put the bags of milk in. You know, and then you, you take the bag of milk and you cut it and you put it in the jug and then that's what you pour the, the milk into. Tell me that I'm not crazy. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, thank you. That's what I drink water out of on Sunday mornings because it's big and it doesn't matter if I lose it. So if you find one around, don't drink out of it because I've been drinking out of it. But a lot of people think, what is he, what's he thinking? Why is he carrying that thing around? Why doesn't he just drink out of a normal cup? Well, because it's not big enough. I like to have a big... A big thing with me. But so we can think, okay, what what were they thinking? I grew up, you know, Casey said my parents are here. A lot of my life was shaped around my mom saying, Christopher, what were you thinking? And the answer, parents, that I would give back was always, I wasn't. Right? Have you heard that from your kids? What were you thinking? Well, I, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking at all. And when we don't think, we get into trouble. Now, you can look at other people. You could say, what were they thinking? But you can also look inward at yourself, and you can ask the question, what was I thinking? So I'll, I'll tell you a story. <clears throat> Sometimes as um, pastors, God just gives us sermon illustrations. It's like a gift. Uh, it's amazing when it happens. And this kind of happened uh, the other night. On Friday night, one of the houses, or actually our neighbor's house, caught on fire. And earlier in the week, or a week and a half ago, it was very recent, there were three houses in Pinelands that caught on fire, and, and I think two of them burned down, but it's a tragic situation. And on Friday night, I'd been out with my parents, we'd been to dinner, and, and we were getting ready to go to bed, and we could hear, you know, kids yelling and screaming, and we thought, you know, okay, the neighbors just being a little bit loud, or, you know, these kids are going crazy, and I'm, I'll never complain about that because during the day, mine are nuts. So I'm very sorry for the people that live around us. And something in me just said, no, go, go outside. <clears throat> so I went outside, mostly because I was nosy. And as I go outside, I, I look, and, and through our gate, there's just a, the, the families in the road, and they're yelling, and I hear one of them yell, like, the house is on fire. And I think like, oh no, you know, and I don't see cars, I don't see adults. And so I think, well, the adult is maybe still in the house. And what I didn't know is there had been an explosion before that. Uh, my parents had felt the explosion against the wall. And my son uh, and some friends were in our pool and they had heard the explosion. I didn't know that. So I go in, into the house and I'm wondering, is somebody hurt, is somebody in this fire? And I'm very quickly, I run in, I find where the fire is. It was in a back kind of patio area. And they had a big stove that was connected to a propane bottle. And in that propane bottle, something, or in that stove, something had exploded. And so all the burners were like, um, were like uh, uh, rocket launchers or like just fire, just like crazy, uh, flamethrowers. That was what I was looking for. Like flamethrowers against the ceiling. And I thought, this ceiling is going to catch. This thing is going gonna, is gonna to go. And I, I look, and the propane bottle, the a big one, was leaning against the stove. And I thought, well, if the, if the tubing catches on fire. Anyway, it's, I mean, you guys can imagine. It's a tough situation there. It smells like somebody dumped a, a bucket of Legos onto the surface of the sun, just burning plastic uh, it was nasty. You couldn't see anything in front of you. And so I thought, okay, I know that I just need to get around. And if I can turn the propane off, then the fire will at least will go down. I can stop the flow of the propane because something inside had definitely exploded. And I had a little fire extinguisher in my hand, like the one we have at the kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> that are laughing. Yeah, it was laughable. 
So I, I've got it here, and I just a couple minutes. I I thought a couple seconds. Thought, okay, here's here's the things that could go wrong. Here's what I think I can get done. As, as long as the propane's flowing and the the flames are up, I, I don't think I'll have an explosion. Let me see. So there was a, a nanny, and she was behind me, and. I turned to her and I gave her the fire extinguisher and I said, I'm going to go to it and turn off the, the, try and turn off the propane, hoping that it wasn't broken. And I said, if it blows up, will you spray me down? <laughs> right, right? You know, like that little thing would have worked, you know? That thing could not extinguish a pan of eggs, you know, on your own stove. And, um, and so I gave it to her and I, I just... Like, okay, here it goes. I hope it doesn't blow up. And there's that, like, excited, like, oh, man, is this really going to happen, you know, here. And I tap the propane bottle to see if it's hot. It's hot. Tap the, the thing. And I, I start to turn it to turn it off. And I look over my shoulder. And she's gone. <laughs> she is gone. She is not there to spray me down if I catch on fire. She has, she was saying, what was he thinking? giving me this fire extinguisher because I am gone. She took, she was <laughs> gone. <clears throat> so in the first service, I moved on with the sermon. I thought, well, that's it. And then <laughs> the people were upset because they wanted to know what happened with the fire, you know. <clears throat> so I, I did get the propane off and then some people rushed in from out, out, out on the road and um, I kind of stepped back and they pulled, this stove was on a pallet, they pulled it out into the yard and, and then my little fire extinguisher shows back up again, and there's a guy trying to use it, and it's not doing anything. Uh, the, the inside of that stove looked like, the, like molten, just like the surface of the sun. And so then they started dousing it with water and stuff to keep it, uh, to finally put that out. And so the fire did, did get put out. And then all the fire trucks showed up, which I took videos for our kids because they got the, you know, then I could show them the next morning. But the family was all good. Everything was good. So that's the closure I did not give the first service was that the fire was put out and it was fine. I played my very small little role of just turning the propane off. But there was definitely this moment... What was I thinking when I gave that fire extinguisher to that lady, thinking that she would do anything with it? And then she was thinking, what was he thinking by giving this thing to me? Because I am out of here. So (laughs) the point to this is, is um, I kind of want to just introduce the idea to you that it's, it's good to ask this question. What was I thinking? What am I thinking? It's good to ask yourself what you're thinking. Thoughts are good to examine and to analyze. You should many times a day ask yourself, okay, where'd this come from? What was this thought? Why did this happen? Why am I thinking this? Where, where's the source of this? What were they thinking? Why did they do this thing the way that they did? What's going on in their life? You know, there, there's, there's, those are good things to ask. And it's because our thoughts are so important. Your thoughts are one of the strongest things that, that you have access to and power to. You know, do, do you know, so this has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's interesting. Do you know what the number one most powerful performance-enhancing drug is? You know, th- th- this is, you know, the, all the different kinds of steroids and uh, all the different kinds of medicines, needles, pills, all that stuff. The number one most powerful performance-enhancing drug is sleep. Isn't that crazy? And kind of in the same way, like we wouldn't think this, but probably I'd be willing to wager the number one most influential life-shaping element in your life would be your thoughts, which is great because that means that that I have access to it and control over it, Not, not you. You can't take my thoughts. You can't control my thoughts. You can try and influence my thoughts. My situation can make my thoughts really hard. It can make my thoughts really easy. You know, it, when my wife, you know, tells me she loves me and she takes such good care of me, it gives me warm, fuzzy thoughts and great thoughts. When things in the world aren't so great or the car won't start or things, you know, happen or you get a phone call and find out somebody's, you know, sick, you know, your thoughts go to a harder place. But the, the point is, is that no matter your situation, you are not the victim You know, for everybody that is born into and has a bad situation, and I recognize that I come from enormous privilege. 
Uh, my parents, you know, who are here, they worked their tails off. And they gave us an enormous amount of privilege and blessing. And we grew up in ways that, that, uh, that you know, 99% of the world would just give anything for. And I understand that I came from that. But I also understand that there's not a single person that is a victim to their situation. Because your situation is not the most powerful thing in your life or in your world. It's your thoughts. Because you show me a bad situation, there's always, I tell Lipa this, our, our son, all the time, somewhere on some portion of the world, there's a little boy or girl born with no arms, no legs, no running water, laying in the dirt and being fed by a village elder somewhere. And you know what? That's a horrible sounding situation. But I'm thankful that I've got four arms, four legs that I can feed myself. But also, I'm assuming that that little boy or little girl isn't happy. They may be the happiest person in the world. But the, the point to that exercise and thought is that you're not a victim to your situation. You're not a victim to your circumstances. You're not a victim. I think this is extremely, extremely relevant to South Africa where, where we've had apartheid. And when I say we, I don't mean me because, you know, Casey and I were called here. We get to serve this country and serve this church. And we get to learn from those that have come before us and those are in it before us. And, and, but this country has gone through this thing of apartheid which has separated people out and situationally tried to tell you that because you are here, your situation puts you here, your, your worth or your value is different because your situation puts you here and here and it just categorized everybody but the thing that I know the truth and I know this because I, I, I meet you every day is that across all those old categories there's not there's amazing wonderful people I've not met a bad person because it's the situation it's it, it, it it's the it's the thought that has the influence it's not your situation now, I'm not here to say that your situation doesn't deserve uh, to be looked at or cared for or taken care of. And I'm not here to say that you're not allowed to have a bad day or to have bad thoughts or that you're not allowed to be upset with your situation. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. But what I'm hoping to do is this is that thing that I hope uh, convinces you to say, I want to apply this to my life. Is What I'm hoping to do is explain to you that you hold within you a weapon that nobody can take from you. You hold within you a, a switch for change that nobody else can flip. It's only yours. You have a switch for change that nobody else can turn off once you've turned it on. You, you have the ability to be exactly who and anything that you want to be. And it all starts with this most powerful thing that we have access to. And that is our thoughts. In fact, your, your thoughts determine your decisions. And your decisions determine your direction. As we... Think about things. It determines how we make decisions. And when we make those decisions, a collection of those decisions will lead us into a direction. Your, your direction that you're going in your life is dictated by the thoughts. Your, those thoughts are that, that steering wheel, that, that gas pedal. That's what's taking you there. Your thoughts determine your decisions. How are your decisions? Trace it back to your thoughts. Your decisions determine your direction. Do you like the direction you're going in? If you don't, then guess what? You have the ability to change it. Because this doesn't say your neighbor, your father, your mother, your son, your daughter. It doesn't say your business, your work, your opportunity, your economic bracket, your socioeconomic income. It doesn't say your color, your race, your culture. It doesn't say any of those things determine your decisions and your decisions determine your direction. No, it's just your thoughts. Because that's something that nobody can take away from us. That's ours. And it's the most powerful thing that we have for shaping who we are and who we become. And our thoughts, they soak in us. You, know, you ever met a happy person uh, a, a person that was happy on the outside and wasn't happy on the inside, it's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last for a long time. Because eventually what's on the inside just soaks out. In fact, what you think about, what you think about in your head always plays itself out in your life. Always. What happens in here always manifests itself out there. What's going on in here in your thinking 
always influences the decisions that you make, and that decision that you make influences the direction that you go. It all goes back to your thinking. In fact, I've got a great quote here from Ralph Waldo Emerson, great guy, and he says this, and, and, and this is so true for your life. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow, so for those of you that are like me, if you don't know what this word sow means, it's planting. You know, it's planting a, uh, if you plant a thought, you reap, you harvest, you get back from the ground the, the, the action. So if you th sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap character. If you sow character, you reap destiny. What that means is that I could sit down with every single one of you. And I could look at exactly where you are in your life. You could explain to me, this is my, my current life situation. This is where I am right now. And I could get you back to that place by tracing where you are back to your character, by tracing your character back to the decisions that you make, by tracing your decisions back to your thoughts. You can trace it all the way back. Exactly where you are, whether you're happy or not, but exactly where you are begins with your thoughts. A thought brings action. Actions create habits. Habits built up over time create character of who we are. See, this and my, my hope before I move on from this is just to re-emphasize to you is that you hold within you one of the most powerful, influential tools. There is almost nothing on this earth that can overcome the, the way that we think about ourselves, maybe love. Love may be the only thing that's more powerful than thought, than the way that we think. Because lo lo love hits us in our soul. But, but our thoughts, maybe second to love, is the most powerful thing that you have. And what you don't understand, maybe you do, maybe you don't, is right now as we speak, even if you don't agree with this, this is working in your life right now. This is happening. Because your life is always moving in the direction of some of your strongest thoughts. Always. It's never on idle. It's always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Now this should be encouraging. Because if you don't like the direction, you can change your thoughts. It doesn't mean you need anybody else or anything else to change it. It's, it's here. So every person in this room can be encouraged because in here, and in here you have the ability to change your life if you're not happy with it. And so then the question that we get to ask is this. How do we change the way that we think in order to impact the way that we live? So this is, again, where I would ask you this. I don't want to be entitled. You may love the way you think, or you may love the way that you live. You don't have anything wrong with the way that you're living your life. Everything is flowing. Everything is good. You know, the... Uh, everything in life's clicking together, you're happy, you may love it. And if that's you, that's fantastic. I love it. I'd like for you to never come back because I'm jealous. Some of you are, are awake. That's good. No, there's, there's very few people are that way. Very few people. But if that's you, that's great. I'm not here to make you look for bad things in your life. My brain does that to me. You know, you lay down at night and you think like, oh man, today's been a great day. You know, hung out with the kids and swam in the pool and I ate pretty good, you know, worked out, watched my calories, went on a walk with the wife. Things are fantastic. You lay down, your head hits the pillow and then your brain goes, hey, remember that thing you did in seventh grade? <laughs> remember that thing, you know, remember how insecure that you were when you did that? Uh, remember that thing you said three months ago and how that person has messaged you back? Well, that's because you just totally ruined the relationship. And then, you know, you're awake. You know, my brain does, our brain does that for us. My brain does that for me. So I'm not trying to convince you that if your life is good for you to go look for something that's not good. So if you're riding on a high right now and you're happy with where things are and where things are going, then great. Please put this in your pocket because you're going to need it. There will come a time when you will need this. But if we want to change the way that we think in order to impact the way that we live, how, how is it that we do that? Now, because you're in church, I'm going to use the Bible to show you this. And the reason that I think the Bible is a good thing to use to show you this is because we, as people, were made in the image of God. Now, because I was made in the image of God... God knows me really well. 
God is my creator. And because God is my creator, follow me here, God knows the way that my parts work better than anybody or anything else. So my creator, who knows the way my mind, my heart, my soul, all that works, he has written a bit of an instruction manual. And throughout the Bible, that manual kind of leaks out. That manual gets revealed. So here, we have a piece of that manual where Paul is writing a letter to the church in, in Rome, uh, which is the book of Romans, and he is revealing to them how to use their thoughts to better their lives. Now that's why I think the Bible is a great place to turn for this, because it's written by the one that knows me the best. And so when I hear something referencing the way that I think, and it's coming from the Bible, that means it's coming from my Creator. That's the way that I look at it. So when I read something that Paul's written, I read it as, okay, this is coming from my creator. He knows me the best, so therefore I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, okay, yes, I agree with this. This is good. I'm going to adopt this right here. And so that's why we're going to look at Romans. And we're going to look at what Paul wrote in Romans. And what's happening, to give you some context here, is in, in, in Rome, in early Rome, you had the, the Jewish church. And, and then you had kind of the movement of Jesus that kind of made its way into Rome. And there was a time when the Jewish, we'll call them Christians, just for the sake of this uh, service, or Christ followers, they were exiled away. And when they were exiled away, there was a gap. And so all the Gentiles, so anyone that wasn't Jewish, that became a Christ follower, they started doing church. They're doing church their way. Because there is no Jewish person to say, this is the way you should do church. And eventually... The Jewish Christ followers, they, they work their way back in. And now when they come back in, you have what we call a conflict of interest. Because the Gentiles say, we do church this way. And the, the Jewish people say, no, we do church this way. And Paul is saying, God, there's only one way you do church, guys. But what's happening is you have old habits up against kind of new testimony. You've got kind of the old habits, and it's butting up against a, a new way that's being born. And so what Paul wants to do is unite these two groups together. So he's got to find a way to get the two to come together and be united as one. And so here's what he says to them in Romans 12, verse 1. And it's not complicated. We've only got a few more minutes left in here before we go into some worship, and you get to put this into practice. This is not a complicated thing here. And I love the way that Paul kind of lays it out for us. He says in verse 1, uh, chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Now, if you're like me, you just probably zoned out. Raise your hand if you zoned out through all that. No, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, I was looking to see if anybody would. This is just like a, this is like a wall of text. Let, let me help you kind of understand what Paul is saying right here. Because it's, 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 this is encouraging stuff right here. Because Paul needs to unite these people. So he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. The mercies that he's talking about here is, hey, he... Because Jesus died on the cross for you, that's a mercy. By God's mercy for you, the mercies of God. Meaning you're not punished for what you should not be punished for. Grace is you're being gifted a gift that you don't deserve. Mercy is you're being forgiven. You're being forgiven a punishment that you deserve to get. And because you're not being given the punishment of death that your sins should give you, you are experiencing a mercy of God. So Paul from the beginning is saying, I, let me start with, reminding all of us that we are here because of the mercy of God. That's why we're all here. And you're going to present your body as a sacrifice. They knew sacrifices. Sacrifices had this horrible habit of dying on an altar. And so he says you're going to be a living sacrifice, which means that they're going to never die, but always put themselves on the altar. That, that's, that's, that's a heavy statement. That means that they're going to put their will and their wishes to one side, and they're going to put themselves on the altar because you sacrifice to the God. And by being a living sacrifice, you are accepting that you're not the God. So I'm accepting that it's not 
Chris's world. It's not about me. It's about God. So Paul, right in the beginning, because God is so good and he forgave you, and because you're actually dying to yourself, you're a living sacrifice, meaning you're not God. I'm God. God is God. Jesus is God. Put yourself on the altar. See, when you look at it that way, you see Paul just chopping this church down, leveling the playing field on both sides. And, and, and that, that's what they're reading when they, that's what they're interpreting when they read this. And then he wraps it up in verse 1 by saying, oh yeah, th- this is intelligent worship. So you know what? I love the way Paul writes. Paul basically ends this verse off by saying, you're, you're dumb if you don't believe this. Don't be dumb. Be intelligent. Worship intelligent. This, this, is, this is the way that smart people would worship. So then he goes on in verse 2. Now that he's got their attention. And, and, and this is the verse that many of us know. But he says, And do not be conformed to this world. I want you to remember that word, conformed. Any longer to his superficial values and customs. The things of the world don't matter. Don't be conformed to it. But be transformed and progressively changed. See, he, he's asking them to be transformed and progressively changed. Meaning... The two groups that have brought their way in, he says, it's not about conforming to what you want or what you want. It's about transforming. So he gives them this this great kind of piece of advice here where he's asking them to continue to mature. He's asking them to change. But it all kind of comes down to this spot right here. The way that you become transformed rather than conforming is by the renewing of your mind. He says, as you mature spiritually, by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. It's all about the renewing of the mind. And then when you renew the mind, he goes on to say, you renew your mind so that, as the verse continues, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, the the, the beautiful picture there is, as part of the, the benefit of renewing your mind, what Paul is saying is, is that you'll then know the will of God, which means that you'll know what's important and which, what isn't important. It'd be great if I could filter all my stresses through a filter and I could just, just kind of plop them all in and just audibly hear God say, not important, not important, not important, not important. Uh, let's pick that one and deal with that one. You know, that, that would be fantastic. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Renew your mind. And then you'll know the will of God. You'll know the perfect and pleasing will of God. You'll know what actually really matters. And so there's a lot of good things in Romans 12 too, but we're specifically talking about renewing the mind. So I want to put that back on the screen here for you. How is it that we are going to change our minds so that it changes our life? We do that through renewing our mind. And the word renew actually means restore. Now, th- this to me is a really beautiful thing here because restoration means that uh, if the word was to, to create, that would mean that there's something that I don't possess that I need God to create in me. But instead, the word is restore. That means that what I need is already in me. I don't need anything else. Actually, what's happened is, is, is I've added and added and added and added things on. And what God has given me or put in me, that thing that I need, is no longer visible. It's like a, a piece of furniture that gets painted over and over and over and over again. If you want to restore that furniture to its original state, it's hard to know what the original paint color is. Ladies, your hair is this way. Some of you that dye your hair... You've forgotten what your original hair color is because it's buried in there. It's under there. You know, I think about a a piece of furniture. You have this beautiful piece of furniture, and you want to restore it. And you know that at one point in time, it had this beautiful maybe yellow color, but it's not. It's, it's, you know, been painted. It's been handed down in generations. You want to restore it. How do you restore that? You have to sand it down. You know, when you sand a piece of furniture down, it's hot, especially if you do it this time of year. 
Uh, it's hot, it's rough, there's dust all over the place, it's uncomfortable, it's hard work, it's nitty gritty, you have to get in the cracks and the details, it's work and it's effort. But it's taking away the old before you put the new on, or taking away the old to expose that beauty that was already there. And the encouraging thing about this for, for us is, is, is this, that you don't need anything put in you or created in you for you to be different, for you to renew your mind. So Paul is saying, renew your mind to change your life. When you renew your mind, you restore your mind back to what Christ intended for your mind. I'll, I'll give you one more example of that before we pray here. This morning, my son Benjamin, uh, who is, uh, turns five in April... Uh, but for those of you that are new, he's this old here. And, and he came to church this morning wearing a flash costume. All right, so he had not just the pants or a flash t shirt, this was a full on costume with a headpiece on, a mask, everything. And I thought, that's amazing. Uh, I can't remember being that like, unself aware ever in my life. And he just, he rocked it proud. He comes into the back of the auditorium and He's like, you know, hey, look at me, and uh, you know, I give him a hug, and he's like, Daddy, look at how fast I can run, all right? And then he, he, he runs, and he comes back, and I'm like, wow, you know, you, you're, like, you're so fast. And he's like, I know, you know, I am. You know, it's like me saying, who's, who's my favorite Benjamin? He's like, I'm your favorite Benjamin. It'd be like, I mean, I might as well give him all the wealth in the world when I answer that question. He's like, yeah, I'm your favorite. Yeah, I'm the flash. Look how fast I am. This is amazing. See, that, that, that's a mind that's not been painted over by the world. That's a mind that's not been messed with. That's a mind that's not been told, you look silly or you're dumb. That's, not, that, that's a mind that's not had the weight of the world and the stress of the world put on it. That's a, that's a mind created the way that God wanted to create a mind in relationship with him. See, Benjamin's relationship with me is, is you know, reflective of my relationship with God. See, what I would love to be able to do is wake up in the morning, not be so self-aware, and put on the costume of fatherhood. And then say, hey, look at me run, Dad. Look how good of a dad I am. And then for my heavenly father, I, I see we don't know he's there and saying this, but he is. And then our heavenly father, he, he looks at me and he says, you're doing such a good job. Look how great of a dad that you are. See, not, not, that's not always where I wake up and where I am, but that's always in me. Because God is always that kind of God for me. But see, I have to renew my mind. I have to restore my thinking. If I never change the way that I think, then my actions are never going to change. But I don't need anything in my life to happen. I don't need any of my situations to change. I don't need more money. I don't need anything. The only thing that I need to do to step into a beautiful situation like that is, is right here. It's to say, let me let this be restored. Restored back to what God created it to be. And that's in love with Him, loved by Him, loved by a Heavenly Father. Now that's just one situation. What if you put on the costume of motherhood or the costume of a son, the costume of a daughter? What if you put on you know, your, your, your flash that, that, was, that was just you as a confident young man or a confident young woman? What, what would that be that you would put on? If, if you took away what the world has told you and you just kind of renewed your mind and you changed the way that you thought and you started thinking thoughts like you would think through the mind of a little boy or a little girl wearing a flash costume, asking your daddy to watch you run up and down the row of a church. See, my prayer for you as we close this service out, I'm about to have the band's going to come up and lead us in worship. See, I know that there is better out there for all of us because I know the creator that made us. And I know what He has in store for us. And I know the potential that there is within each and every single one of us. But my prayer as we sing this worship set here is that God puts in your mind a costume 
for you to put on. Father, son, daughter, mother, friend, whatever it is, lover, that you put that on and you just run up and down the hallway metaphorically or emotionally or whatever in your mind and you hear the voice of the Father tell you, look how amazing you are. I love you. You're my favorite Chris. You're my, fa you know, like let God just tell you over these next few minutes that you're his favorite. Let, let that change the way you think about you and about the life around you. That's the power that we have just with our thinking. Your life can change today. And it starts with just letting your mind align with Christ. And if it aligned with anything with him, it would be how much he loves you. Let's bow our head and close our eyes and lead us in prayer. And then the band's going to come out and they're going to sing for us. And we're going to play some worship songs. And in the back of the room, we'll have a chance for you to get prayer. If you need prayer for anything in the world, you can go back there and there'll be somebody to pray with you. And like uh, my, my beautiful wife said, we've got communion on one side and, and